So I'll, I'll resume with a question for the audience, uh, especially those who have done uh, who are familiar with the basics of theory of computation should be able to answer this question. So what is the potential problem in using a DFA? Somebody? Yeah, what is the problem in, so we presented an approach where you take the posting list through the DFA and compute a, uh, a final posting list that the DFA, DFA should have matched. So what is the problem in this approach? Large number of states. The DFA could be very large, <coughs> right? Uh, so typically you, you can map a regular expression directly to a non-deterministic finite state automaton. But uh, when you convert that non-deterministic finite state automaton to a deterministic automaton, the, the, the number of states just blows up. So there's a problem. The number of states will be too many, corresponding too many possible roots uh, in the uh, non-deterministic version. And this non-determinism primarily comes from, uh, what does this non-determinism primarily come from in regular expression? Where is this non-determinism? Pardon? Wildcard and? Pardon? Yeah, ORs, right? A or B. So these are the two primary sources. <clears throat> so uh, what could be done instead is that uh, the regular expression itself could be taken apart and uh, we could see if the posting list could be uh, processed using the original regular expression. Fortunately, um, things like OR or things like uh, you know STAR uh, could be handled fairly easily with a posting list. If you want to do an OR with two posting lists, you just merge. If you want to do a, a STAR, you just need to find uh, a sequence right, in, within the same posting list. So uh, it might it it looks like it's an it's unnecessary uh, converting the regular expression to DFA and then passing the posting list through the DFA. So <coughs> oh. huh? So <coughs> instead of uh, of a DFA view of the regular expression, how about a, a different view? Here's a view that some literature talks about uh, uh, called an AND or tree or a DAG. <coughs> Basically, give, let's consider this regular expression B or A followed by C or B plus plus. Now, this instead of a plus, you could also have a 1 to 3, <coughs> numbers like 1 to 3, specifying an interval. So, uh, what we do here is identify a regular expression at the root which is the whole thing and then we consider decomposing the regular expression into smaller parts. So this regular expression R consists of uh, R1, uh, a, sorry, uh, R1 followed by B and this R1 can repeat multiple times. And what does this R1 correspond to? It just corresponds to um, A followed by C or B plus the whole thing plus. This is R1 and this plus sits on top and uh, this R is basically B or this entire chunk, right. <clears throat> so you can, uh, the idea is you can decompose a, a bigger, uh, larger regular expression into smaller regular expressions and, and basically consider the larger regular expression to be a composition of the smaller regular expression. And the idea is to uh, uh, process the posting list for the smaller regular expressions and obtain a posting list for the larger regular expression. So this is a different view and this seems to help us a lot. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the nodes that are in square boxes, uh, the rectangular boxes, they represent all nodes. The nodes in circle represent and uh, followed, no, followed by. So yeah, sorry, I, I missed that notation. Um, and there's also this uh, clean, oper clean operators of star and plus, etc., that could be sitting on individual nodes. <clears throat> so this is the idea. Instead of doing an NFA to DFA conversion, scan regular expression from left to right and build an and or graph. We will not get into the construction. It's fairly simple. 
and each node additionally contains uh, two uh, properties. One is if whether the node itself is optional. Uh, if the node has a star or a question mark, then it's optional. Um, and whether it has uh, recursion, whether there's a self loop. So all you need to do is keep track of these two, um, and uh, and the, and the property of the node itself, whether it's square or round. And we and you can pro process posting lists starting from smaller regular expressions. So I, I'll skip this. Uh, how to exactly construct? Uh, you can modify the constant and merge operations slightly to be able to handle uh, star and plus and self loops. It's not very difficult. <coughs> and what you also do is uh, attach a flag with every posting list. So posting list uh, that gets processed as a flag with, uh, uh, denoting whether it is op whether it is optional or not or whether it should have a self loop or not <coughs> uh, the idea behind having these flags is uh, instead of materializing all possible um, uh, you know enumerating all possible uh, 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 recursions etc in that in that uh, posting list you defer it you defer that processing to a later step So, uh, so here is this basic idea. You start with uh, reverse topographical sorting of the the and or graph. You start with a uh, uh, node in the bottom, and for each node at the bottom, uh, you determine what the type of that node is. If it's an and node or the circular node, you need to invoke uh, this operator of uh, consecutive intersection. If it's odd, then you need to uh, invoke merge. If it's a self loop, you need a slight variant of consecutive intersection because self loop is uh, like consecutive intersection. Mm -hmm. And then you associate a flag with the uh, output uh, posting list. So this, uh, this is just an example of what you could do. I'm sure there are uh, many interesting uh, paradigms possible with processing on posting lists. Uh, many that search engines might be even using. <coughs> so. The worst case complexity of this process is a product of the posting lists uh, in the entire uh, that are processed through this uh, regular expression tree. <coughs> so here are some experimental results. Um, so we took a bunch of rules. Um, there were some standard rules for uh, four annotation types: person name, company name, location, and date. And uh, we. Uh, we stuck to two data sets, Enron and Reuters, because we, real, we not only wanted to evaluate the speed, but we also wanted to make sure that um, the annotations we get are consistent with what uh, annotators have obtained on this, this document, so, so that we have comparable accuracies. Because we could always report great speed on great speed with a pathetic annotator, so which will defeat the purpose. Um, so we uh, use these for benchmarking. Um, and uh, what do we observe? So we observe that gate, one of the uh, I mean, well-known rule-based annotators. Um, uh, we get almost an order of, I mean, more than an order of magnitude speed up in many cases, but, but with Reuters, is slightly less than an order of magnitude speed up. Um, and the reason uh, we realize is that the smaller the collection, in this case, Reuters is uh, much smaller than Enron email. The smaller the connection, the more more the overheads are of uh, processing. Uh, we have factored in the indexing time, so this includes the indexing time. Uh, so the overhead of indexing is more, that uh, the chunk is more, and hence the speed up factor is less. And the greater speed up uh, is achieved on larger types. And also we we did some uh, uh, an, a study on what what aspect of the indexing consumes how much time. <clears throat> and again, we realized that uh, um, the orthographic entity types, the dictionary entity types, all of them uh, takes relatively more time on the Reuters collection. And uh, interestingly, we tried adding some uh, rules, adding some additional features, and saw um, where, what is the effect. So we can actually cache uh, the results of previous operations, including consecutive intersection and merge. Because um, even if you have a large number of rules, the number of nodes that sit in the middle are not too many for these and graphs. So with this caching, uh, we got a much uh, larger speed up. Um, so which means that if we have a few more uh, annotations placed in, a few more rules placed in, uh, we can actually um, leverage the computations from the previous round. 
of, of annotation. And uh, what happens with increasing size of collection? So, um, so with, as the collection size increases, the overhead of indexing itself uh, starts becoming negligible. <clears throat> so, now there are many other interesting questions also. So, now we have got, <coughs> we have trans uh, converted uh, rules of a feature matching uh, on the collection into uh, operations on the inverted index. And these operations could be represented in the form of a plan. Uh, and these plans are very similar to what you have uh, for query execu execution in databases. You have a query execution plan. And therefore, many similar problems start coming up. So, let us say you want to look at uh, matches of any word at IBM.com. And let us say any word is, uh, is a cap capitalized word. What can you do? So, you could look at any word at followed by IBM, followed by dot, followed by com. That could be one way you can uh, process the sequence. The other way is to look at at IBM first, um, followed by dot, followed by com, then any word. If this any word is a macro for uh, a regular expression macro for matching any, any word. So, which of these is going to be uh, more useful? Uh, so, what would be your answer? Why would you go for the second one? Selectivity. selectivity. So, you go by selectivity, which means, um, the, uh, and you are looking at a selectivity of what? IBM. IBM. Okay. <clears throat> so, you would, ex you would expect too many matches of any word. Mm. And you would like to defer that operation to, till the end. So, uh, what basically I am trying to highlight is that there are multiple uh, ways of looking at the evaluation. So, which evaluation is plan is better depends on the selectivity. Um, so, therefore, uh, you know, you, have, you can have multiple AND or plan, uh, which basically specify a sequence of constant and merge operations. And uh, the, the reason we have this equivalence is because uh, the consecutive intersection operation is associative. And because merge is associative as well as commutative. <clears throat> now, in database optimization, um, constant has an equivalent of join, this kind of join, right? So, uh, in the join operation, is it uh, is it uh, associative? Yes, and is it commutative? Join is commutative as well. So, given that join is commutative as well as associative, um, the the Many of the problems for data uh, for optimization in databases have been found to be NP hard. Fortunately for us, at least uh, um, the, this operation is associative but not commutative, and therefore the number of equivalent plans uh, which you could have obtained with commutativity of constant uh, are not there. So there are, no, there are no plans that you can obtain by just uh, using any commutative op property of constant because that that's not the case. So modulo the merge, which is associative as well as commutative we can uh, apply constant smartly and uh, do some optimization. So, basically the closest problem uh, that comes in literature, in algorithms literature is the matrix chain multiplication problem. So, uh, so let us say you are trying to multiply matrices L1, L2, Ln, right, if they are matrices, imagine they are matrices. So, is matrix multiplication associative? Yes, right. Is it commutative? No, it is not committed. <clears throat> and uh, there are there is a polynomial time algorithm for finding the right uh, parenthesization of matrix chain for multiplication. So, I uh, will skip this and basically all we need to do is leverage uh, uh, the a dynamic programming algorithm from this uh, from this area in order to perform our optimization. And uh, we found that well with this uh, we get some imp uh, we get some, I would say, factor of two, sometimes factor of one point five improvement. We didn't expect two two great gains. Uh, <clears throat> then another problem. So now we are in the uh, database kind of arena. So we have uh, another problem in databases called multi-query optimization. So let's say you have uh, two regular expressions. R one is A followed by B followed by C plus C plus is like or uh, followed by E. Okay. 
So plus is R and star is uh, followed by. And R2, which is F plus G followed by A followed by B. So you see that um, if I might, I can, I can come up with an optimal plan for R1. I might come up with an optimal plan for R2. But it isn't necessary, necessary that the plan for R1 and the plan for R2, the optimal ones, <coughs> will have uh, a computation for A followed by B. They might decide to defer the computation of A uh, to the end or computation of B to the end. But if you have multiple queries, you, it might uh, be useful to uh, factor in the, uh, the, the common parts across those rules. Right? Any questions here? <clears throat> so this pro problem is again equivalent to multi multiple matrix chain multiplication. So if you have uh, two matrix chains being multiplied, you can find an optimal ordering for the first and the, an optimal ordering for the second. But uh, what about an optimal ordering for the two combined, given you want to minimize the overall cost, not just the cost for each individual matrix chain multiplication. <clears throat> so, so here's an example, right? Uh, um, you have R1 and R2, so you find that there is this component of A followed by B, uh, A followed by B or C followed by D. This part is actually common to the two. So while you might decide to split this and uh, maybe combine D with E or, and A with F here, um, if I were to look at them independently, I might have different thoughts if I were to look at them collectively. Now unfortunately this problem is NP hard and it can be reduced from the smallest grammar problem. So we had to resort to some heuristics. But again, I just wanted to give a flavor of, okay, what are the things you could do? <coughs> uh, now these rules, uh, I mean, these could be rules today. This could be features tomorrow for some complex machine learning processing. One uh, interesting point that came up from yesterday's uh, panel discussion, what, how about scaling up NLP operations to large collections? And this is something that I, I always w wanted to uh, look at. Uh, how can dependency parsers be run on large collections? Um, <clears throat> so they have a significant overhead in terms of the computations, but what I do realize is there are a lot of repeated computations. Um, so can can those repeated computations be factored out, and can can uh, the the whole process of uh, NLP uh, or specific pro uh, specific aspects of NLP be scaled using such operations? So uh, I will I will skip the the remaining part, and and what we also did was we we built actually a um, a system. For, rapid, for enabling a person to rapidly build uh, annotators. Mm. So this was primarily for building rule-based annotators. Uh, we call it RAD, uh, Scalable Framework for Annotator Development, where a person can write some rules and immediately see the changes that come up. You can also see the reasons why those changes came up, because uh, we, have, we have kept track of what the exact differences were in the, the regular expression plans. <clears throat> And uh, the, the, so what happens is uh, twofold, two, twofold advantages. One is the whole process of feedback becomes fast. And second is uh, even the evaluation becomes fast because uh, like, just like you, you create an annotation index, you can also have a gold standard annotation index and you can get accuracy numbers quickly. So I'm hopeful that some of this can also be uh, used for other tasks, more complex tasks. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, as was me, uh, pointed out by someone in the audience, uh, how do you really create rules or features or whatever? And uh, whether, you, whether there are rules or features, managing them is a challenge. And uh, domain, I mean, adapting to a new domain, wha how do you customize existing rules? Do you, do you learn new rules or features? Um, I think the problems are the same whether you use rules or features. So, <clears throat> um, so one of the areas that I spend a lot of my time on is feature induction. Uh, which is not a part of this talk, uh, but I've been also looking at feature induction in the area of named entity uh, annotation and information extraction. Um, so, for example, this is just a part of the person named entity I extract a return a declarative rule language, very high accuracy, or close to 95 percent, and it's being used. Uh, but how do you build this from scratch, and how do you maintain this? How do you customize this? Can we facilitate rule development using induction? My personal belief is you can never get a human out, outside the loop, um, but you can't get a human to do everything all the time. So can we uh, define uh, an ideal or a healthy dialogue between the two? Um, 
obviously, uh, it's a far from address question. More thought needs to go into it. I'm just going to do, throw some light on things that, that can be done, that have been done. So specifically, can we induce a first cut set of rules with competitive accuracy, which can be modified, tweaked by the rule developer? <clears throat> Especially, uh, we have a group on uh, Indian lang working on Indian languages at IIT Bombay, and uh, we've realized that uh, we cannot do away with rule-based annotators <clears throat> because we need a lot of linguistic insight. Uh -huh. um, and, and in fact, uh, it, very often developing a good rule rule base contributes <coughs> to developing good statistical models because all those features can be just uh, borrowed. So here's a problem statement given as input a, a set of dictionaries, regular expressions, an annotated document collection. So now, unfortunately, if you if you uh, do not want to write all the rules by hand and uh, develop them from scratch, you'll need some annotated collection. So you need either the human human staring at the data to guide the process, or you need some tag data to guide the process. So unfortunately, there is no third alternative uh, that I'm aware of. So <clears throat> Um, so you, you need to resort to some annotated document collection. Uh, it would be great if the annotated collection gets generated as part of the process of, uh, of writing the rules. So if, if there, are, there is a lot of work that has been done on bootstrapping. Uh, at some of it Maya Ramnath presented yesterday. I will talk about some of it more in a, uh, more for vertical search. So the goal is to induce an initial set of rules, have competitive accuracy, and that can be refined, customized by domain expert, which means you need some kind of uh, uh, interpretability in addition to explainability. So there is difference between explainability and interpretability. Explainability by default rules have, because you can do this, uh, you can look at the stack trace. But interpretability requires uh, the rules to appeal to your common sense. I mean, the names to be intuitive, the macros they used to be intuitive. <coughs> So what's the anatomy of a rule-based ex information extractor? This is revisiting what we discussed earlier. Um, <clears throat> this is typically what they have, some three or four phases. Sometimes there are more. Um, so what we, uh, in fact, it's not just us. There are a bunch of uh, uh, approaches that, ha that uh, look at this, uh, look at automating um, uh, and bringing some induction in each of these phases in candidate refinement. So uh, what we do is uh, we use some form of clustering followed by some concepts from relational learning uh, to generate candidate defin uh, definition rules. So unfortunately, these rules, uh, the language for these rules should be uh, at least uh, different clause logic. So, uh, so they, they, they don't fall in the domain of uh, just propositional features. So you need to go beyond just propositional uh, logic to first order logic. <clears throat> um, and what we do is for the candidate refinement phase, we make use of standard propositional learners. <clears throat> and typically these consolidation rules are, uh, are human engineered. So there are, there are techniques uh, like Otto's log, Rapier, and many, many others, uh, which uh, have slightly different strategies which combine these two into one phase. Uh, so I think for the first time we, we actually decided we should just look at these two phases separately and use a different set of uh, techniques, um, different machinery for each of these. So here's a simple illustrative example. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's say you have m dot walk. So <clears throat> you can look at the features of, uh, of, of the different tokens here. So what you can do is look at uh, uh, dictionary and regular expression matches and generate textual spans and you could represent them in first order logic. All you're, just, all you're saying is uh, you're, you're associating uh, some predicate, some property with each token in the sequence. <clears throat> and then you have some glue predicates which say, well, what follows what uh, in the text. So all this can be put together and you can have a slightly uh, a more formal representation of, of the text. This is just the whole purpose of uh, using first order logic is to just formalize the representation. <clears throat> so we are saying that uh, m dot walk is a person um, in document one and it contains m dot, etc. 
<coughs> so, the idea is given two instances, you take their first order representation, <coughs> the respective first order representations and you use uh, a, a very uh, a well known idea called least general generalization. So, least general generalization uh, comes from uh, the understanding the search space of all uh, all possible clauses and uh, the search space happens to be a lattice. <coughs> so, you have a concept of least general generalization of two nodes in the lattice. So, LGG stands for least general generalization and if you generalize these two very intuitively, uh, what, what remain are just the, uh, the parts in blue, the parts in red get eliminated. Because the parts in red are not common to the two instances. Sorry, um, so th th I mean they don't get eliminated; they get generalized. So what's happening here is contains z z two um, before z one z two. Yeah, sorry. The, what's happening here is uh, a generalization of the part in red. What we can do further is <coughs> cluster. Uh, annotations which are of which are, which are of similar types. Uh, Maya talked about some kind of clustering yesterday. Uh, so, this is another kind of uh, I mean uh, uh, way of identifying what all to generalize. So, do I generalize John Smith with J dot Smith? Perhaps <coughs> not because my generalization will be too general. <coughs> so, if you consider all pairs of generalization, the search space also becomes large and you might get garbage. So, the idea is uh, uh, identify clusters <coughs> and instead of uh, computing pairwise least general generalizations, compute least general generalization for clusters and least general generalization uh, is known to be um, asso uh, associative as well as commutative. <coughs> so, you can compute the least general generalization of a cluster in any order you want. <coughs> so, so, the features for clustering are obtained from the RHS of example clusters. So, so this is the kind of uh, clustering you obtain and then you obtain the least general generalization. And then we, uh, this is a very standard strategy that uh, you do not resort to just one level of clustering, you, you do a separate and conquer uh, kind of iterative process, uh, clustering. So, the idea is you perform clustering on the bunch of examples, generalize clusters find and which and generalizations which are not very good drop them which means you drop the examples that those generalizations uh, uh, came from and therefore you need to do a, another round of clustering to cover the examples that were not covered uh, earlier on so uh, this can be used for any uh, any type of annotation we we used it uh, we evaluated only on named entity annotation so so, that is that is a candidate definition part as far as the candidate refinement is concerned uh, I'm, I, I would like to recall that the purpose of candidate refinement is to uh, get rid of conflicts certain certain types uh, need uh, assume priority of certain uh, over certain other types. Uh, going back to the example of Melinda Gates foundation. So, Melinda Gates might be uh, identified as a candidate person whereas, Melinda Gates foundation is a as an organization. So, <coughs> one of them should supersede the other. So, um, if you want to get rid of ambiguity that is. So, in this case what are we saying? Here is another example. Suppose you, uh, uh, I, I, yeah. So, here is an example. So, let us say a Washington post was a mention and you want to identify uh, the, the, the entity type. So, Washington, Washington itself is a location but the Washington Post is an organization. So, here is a simple rule that can be induced uh, which is if one of them matches and the other does not match then it should be a location. So, if, if, lo, uh, if Washington Post is not an organization but Washington is a location then let Washington remain a location. And this can be learned using uh, standard uh, decision list learners. So, the that is a well researched area <coughs> uh, because this, these are just uh, propositional com compositions of uh, predicate matches. So, uh, this is for a small collection I mean all this we evaluated uh, for a small collection uh, of, of 7 to 8 entity types. 
what we discuss next is what happens if you grow this learning process. So we have now focused on learning. So what happens if you want to do this learning and curation for larger uh, vocabulary of entities? Uh, we'll first grow from uh, go from uh, say uh, tens to hundreds, and then uh, the last part of the talk will be well how to handle millions of entity types. <clears throat> so um, this part is about semi-automatic di dictionary curation or information extraction with respect to ontologies which have uh, hundreds of entity types, not just tens. So, um, well, there might be people from, uh, from the semantic web community who might uh, question my uh, definition of, uh, and the use of on the word ontology, but I am going to take liberty and uh, refer to almost any knowledge based on ontology here. Um, and uh, this is a definition I picked up, it an ontology defines a set of representational primitives with which to model a domain of knowledge or discourse. These primitives are typically classes, attributes and their relationships. So you have, you have uh, different uh, nodes here in this ontology and these nodes could be connected to each other using typed edges. <coughs> so uh, uh, there are different kinds of ontologies. One of the ontologies we have been using in our experimentation is, in, is an academic ontology which have been built over some existing benchmark ontologies. Uh, this has uh, more than, I mean as of now it has close to 400 uh, classes and about 150 object and data properties. So the challenge is, uh, now I want to identify instances of, of these nodes in the ontology uh, from a given collection. Uh, so I have neither trading data nor do I have um, the rules or the patterns. How do I grow? How do I, uh, how do I go about? accomplishing my task of identifying instances of ontology nodes. <clears throat> so information extraction and ontology population uh, are uh, in my understanding uh, uh, very closely related. <clears throat> information extraction was identifying instances of a schema from an unstructured repository and ontology population <clears throat> is about filling up templates in the ontology. Uh, from a given repository again. So they, they seem to be um, very closely related. Does it make sense? So, uh, so we, uh, at, at this point we use these two uh, interchangeably. So there are many ontology population approaches. I am just giving you a brief overview. So there are, uh, there is a little, lot of research in IE, so in ontology population communities. Uh, bootstrapping, meta bootstrapping are other or popular in some other aspects. Uh, establishing an alignment might help you grow the ontology uh, uh, much faster. There are also other meth methods like distance supervision and constraint driven learning. Um, so I will just take you through uh, uh, one of these approaches. Uh, and these approaches can also be classified uh, as top down or bottom up. Uh, so the, the top down approach is given an ontology which is, uh, which I, which we look upon as a hierarchy. If you have a annotator for a higher level concept uh, which has a very precise and obvi obvious signature, then you might want to write the annotator for the higher level concept first and then uh, use its output to help write lower level annotators. So you, you could get substantial filtering done using the higher level concepts. To give an example, if I were to write a person a uh, person name annotator, <coughs> which is what we have been discussing for some time. <coughs> um, and, if, uh, and given that uh, a scientist name is a person name, so unless we have uh, uh, scientists in other species, which I am sure we have, but we, we have not realized their potential. So, uh, so assuming that scientists are human beings, are persons, uh, if I were to filter out all, uh, all instances of persons or filter in all instances of persons, I might be able to write better uh, annotators for scientists. <coughs> a bottom up approach is uh, maybe more viable if uh, an obvious signature or rules are not present for higher level annotators. So there some, some concepts could be really abstract. I mean Wikipedia has a lot of these lists, lists of movies in 1980, 1990, uh, list of books published or list of awardees. Now <coughs> they, may, they may not have obvious signatures uh, whereas you may have signatures uh, or you may have patterns to identify the lower level concepts. So um, it will be interesting to see whether uh, 
there can be a, a right mix and match of these two approaches. So in the, in the bottom up approach, uh, you could of course get instances of higher level concepts by, uh, by just considering a union of uh, the entities from the lower level. So we just did some experiments to, uh, to understand this whole process. <clears throat> so we considered, uh, we considered some nodes in an ontology which are uh, independent of the corpus we had. And we also had some nodes in the ontology which were dependent on the corpus. So in, in general, this, this could be the case with any ontology that you have, uh, for, uh, which you're trying to populate. There may be nodes in the ontology which uh, have nothing to do with the corpus. So how do you identify which nodes uh, can be uh, signif have significant correlation with the corpus? So, so we considered some uh, university home pages. Um, we are also now looking at uh, paper repositories. So here is uh, here's some uh, information that you can get from some project pages, uh, the association of people with team members. Some of it is uh, structured, some of, I mean most of it is semi-structured and uh, unstructured. There is hardly any structured information out there. <coughs> so the idea is, uh, can I identify uh, different can I identify these correlations from these pages? Uh, so we realized that, well, to, uh, first of all, I don't have the trading data. But even if I had the trading data uh, for identifying, uh, um, let's say, uh, projects, team members, and mentors, um, how, uh, what kind of features would be useful? So when you look at web pages, <coughs> sequences do not matter as much as visual information. So there has been some work on using visual information for information extraction. Um, in, in particular, WIPs, uh, vision-based space segmentation. <clears throat> so where uh, the, uh, many of the HTML, the DOM tree features have been mapped to visual features <clears throat> so that you can uh, detect blocks of data on web pages. Uh, there is also a related work on uh, element node table extraction. There is a lot, actually there is a lot of work on table extraction, <clears throat> which could also be thought of as uh, identifying uh, visual features. So here is here is an example set of features that might be of relevance for extraction from such uh, pages. So uh, visual could be like number of items in the list more than some threshold uh, in, in, the, in the in the block that you obtain, the ratio of area of list box to that of the viewport greater than some greater than some threshold. These are some existing features. Um, is a document paginated? Is the width of each item box in the same list? Are the list items aligned with each other? <coughs> uh, so Non-alignment of list items necessarily is not a disqualification, but uh, it might make the job of uh, identifying the blocks uh, more critical. Because if, if your blocks are not identified properly, you might get a lot of misalignment. Mm -hmm. And then some lexical features, which uh, are very similar to what we've been discussing, uh, match between. So some of them could be even uh, uh, query-driven, match between keyword queries, uh, 